Hello, my name is Steve Stearns, and I'd like to welcome you to this course on evolutionary medicine. It is aimed at audiences that include undergraduates, medical students, and uh, physicians who are interested in CME credits, and anyone else who is interested in evolutionary insights into medical issues. The course is supported by a book, which just was published a few days ago. Uh, it's co-authored with Ruslan Mejitov, and it's available from Sinauer Associates. The scope of the book actually defines the scope of the course. Evolutionary insights are more important in some parts of medicine than they are in others. And we concentrate on issues where evolutionary biology and evolutionary thinking brings insights that can reduce suffering and save lives either immediately or as basic research continues. Such insights are distributed across many different parts of medicine for, like physics and chemistry, evolutionary biology is a basic science that underpins all of medical science. Here's an overview of the topics. In chapter one, we introduce evolutionary thinking, and then we ask two rather interesting questions. What is a patient and what is a disease? That issue, what is a disease, sets up the discussion of defenses and then takes us on into pathogen evolution, the discussion of cancer, reproductive medicine, and the issue of mismatch. We then go on into mental disorders, discuss how individual versus population thinking uh, is involved in health, and the book concludes with open questions. So in this introduction to the course, in this welcome, I just want to very quickly take you through the highlights of those chapters. So in evolutionary thinking, uh, we recognize that biological evolution is both a process called microevolution that produces a pattern called macroevolution, and both of these ways of thinking are relevant to medicine. The toolkit of these ideas for microevolution includes natural selection, random processes, genetic drift, genetic change, and development. In macroevolution, the framework shifts to history, how history defines relationships, provides an origin for constraints, and again, insights into development. When we think about what is a patient, I think the first thing we recognize is that patients are bundles of trade-offs. They are not built like machines with parts that you can just replace. They contain ancient constraints, Patients vary for both gen genetic and environmental reasons. They age, which makes them vulnerable. And they are unusual among primates. They also contain very important microbiota, which are playing an increasing role in medical explanation. When we come to what is a disease, I think the first thing to mention is that instead of using the traditional categories, of infectious versus chronic, we place diseases into seven categories that reflect their causes and which relate to whether, they, whether evolution could have affected defenses or not. The tissues in the organism and the patient vary from vulnerable to robust. The physiological functions that are involved in disease vary from fixed to adjustable. And many diseases are produced by interactions between genes and environment. So those are some of the highlights about disease. That sets up the discussion of defenses. Defense mechanisms have usually evolved as modifications of processes that were already part of normal physiology. Evolution will tolerate high costs and will permit significant vulnerabilities when those costs and those vulnerabilities are associated with major benefits. Some defenses have major benefits and are associated with large costs and significant vulnerabilities. Pathogens evolve, and they evolve quite rapidly. They have their own agendas, and they respond to human interventions. Their responses include virulence, their roles in the microbiota, the evasion and suppression of defenses, resistance to antibiotics, 
and reactions to attempts to prevent their own evolution. So they are a flexible and highly adjustable population. Cancer is a very interesting part of evolutionary medicine, both because there is a historical component. Evolution built vulnerability to cancer deep into the design of our bodies. It's going to be almost impossible to change that design and eliminate that vulnerability. Every cancer is an independent instance of clonal evolution, and that is fueled by genetic variation. That evolution creates a unique evolutionary history with each patient, and that evolution can be reconstructed with molecular phylogenetics so that we can actually see the history of an individual cancer. That every cancer evolves has some very important implications for therapy. There are also evolutionary insights that are quite interesting and important in reproductive medicine. Evolution helps us to understand menstruation, menopause, the difficulty of childbirth, and the diseases of pregnancy. It also allows us to see that the evolution of the placenta is connected to the risk of cancer. Evolutionary conflicts over parental investment help us to understand the diseases of pregnancy, gestation length, birth weight, and give us some insight into mental disorders. Reproductive events that occur early in life have consequences for health late in life. So there is a whole complex of interesting issues built around the process of reproduction. Mismatch is one of the major concepts in evolutionary medicine, and it arises because our environment has recently been changing more rapidly than our biology can keep up with. The resulting mismatch between biology and environment produces mild to severe loss of evolutionary fitness, which is expressed as contributions to disease states. These diseases include obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, female reproductive cancers, asthma, and autoimmune diseases. So these are part of the complex of diseases that are part of the world's emerging huge health burden. There are also evolutionary insights into mental disorders. Probably the most important one is that mental disorders are disturbances of cognition and behavior that function well in most but break down in a few. Cognition and behavior are complex processes that are influenced both by genetic and by developmental events. They have many components, each of which can vary. That variation produces a distribution of cognition and behavior. We can view some mental disorders as byproducts of selection for normal behavior caused by inescapable features of complex systems. So you can think of the normal behavior as being the center of the distribution and the mental disorders as being the tails of the distribution. They can also be disorders of defense, of homeostasis, and of mismatch. So there are a number of different evolutionary insights into mental disorders. In chapter 10, we discuss individual health versus population benefit. There are conflicts that arise between individuals and populations. When physicians treat individuals, their decisions accumulate to have consequences for epidemiology, demography, and even natural selection. Those consequences often contain conflicts between the welfare of the individual and the welfare of the group, involving externalization of private costs and exploitation of public goods. Important examples include vaccination and antibiotic therapy. And this is the point at which morality enters the discussion of and how it is connected to evolutionary insights. Finally, we close the book with some of the open questions because naturally any searching analysis reveals many places where we need to know more. Can we design evolution-proof antibiotic therapies? Can we switch the host-pathogen relationship from resistance to tolerance? 
do pathogens evolve greater virulence when leaky vaccines are used? Does adaptive therapy slow down cancer evolution? Do evolutionary trade-offs suggest treatments for aging? And does genomic imprinting help to explain autism and schizophrenia? There are some indications that it helps. So in conclusion, evolutionary thinking casts new lights on many areas of medical research and practice. It complements other approaches. It does not replace them. It helps to reduce suffering and save lives, but it also contains fascinating ideas. It's fun. Then go on into mental disorders, discuss how individual versus population thinking uh, is involved in health, and the book concludes with open questions. So in this introduction to the course, in this welcome, I just want to very quickly take you through the highlights of those chapters. So in evolutionary thinking, uh, we recognize, here's an overview of the topics. In chapter one, we introduce evolutionary thinking, and then we ask two rather interesting questions. What is a patient and what is a disease? That issue, what is a disease, sets up the discussion of defenses and then takes us on into pathogen evolution, the discussion of cancer, reproductive medicine, and the issue of mismatch. We th Hello, my name is Steve Stearns, and I'd like to welcome you to this course on evolutionary medicine. It is aimed at audiences that include undergraduates, medical students, and uh, physicians who are interested in CME credits, and anyone else who is interested in evolutionary insights into medical issues. The course is supported by a book, which just was published a few days ago. Uh, it's co-authored with Ruslan Mejitov, and it's available from Seinauer Associates. The scope of the book actually defines the scope of the course. Evolutionary insights are more important in some parts of medicine than they are in others. And we concentrate on issues where evolutionary biology and evolutionary thinking brings insights that can reduce suffering and save lives either immediately or as basic research continues. Such insights are distributed across many different parts of medicine for, like physics and chemistry, evolutionary biology is a basic science that underpins all of medical science.